Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Trip Report and Photo Workshop, Grand India Wildlife Adventure. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Aditya Panda. Aditya, thank you so much for being here today and welcome back from the field. We can't wait to hear what you've been experiencing. Thank you, Sunny. Hello, everyone. Lovely to see you all. It's been a while since I presented last, and that's because uh, I've been practically in the field, out in the field all the time. And uh, I found a couple of days between trips uh, right now, and I thought uh, that would be a great, great uh, chance to get back in touch with all of you again and present another webinar. And uh, today's webinar is on my last, my latest Grand India wildlife adventure. And as the cover slide here shows you, that trip really is a grand safari of India. The amount of wildlife you see on that trip, the amount of diversity you see on that trip is just unmatched. Um, for those of you who are um, viewing one of my webinars for the first time, uh, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Aditya Panda, and I've been leading NatHab's India Adventures since 2016. Um, I primarily lead the Grand India Wildlife Adventure, the India Tiger Quest, and the India Tiger Safari Photo Pro Trips. And uh, when I'm not leading these adventures, when I'm not out in the field leading expeditions, I work in conservation. Uh, particularly in my home state of Odisha, which is in eastern central India. And uh, I work as an honorary wildlife warden in uh, a tiger reserve and an elephant reserve in the central part of my state. Now, back to my latest trip. My last Grand India Wildlife Adventure, like practically all Grand India Wildlife Adventures tend to be, was a phenomenal trip with some amazing wildlife sightings. And of course, a fabulous group of people that I had great fun hosting and leading on this trip. We started as we always do at Delhi, uh, where we all met. And uh, after a short day tour of the city, just to get everybody uh, introduced to the country, uh, we flew the next day to a tiger reserve called Bandhavgarh in central India. Um, and uh, we spent three nights at Bandhavgarh Tiger Reserve and National Park, and then went on to Kanha National Park and Tiger Reserve. And from there, we found our way to the Kaziranga National Park and Tiger Reserve, where, uh, which is in Northeast India, and where we primarily go to look for great one-horned rhinoceros, Asiatic elephants, wild buffalo, and a number of other wild species. The trip was a great success. We had some excellent tiger sightings. Uh, we did not see a leopard, but we did see sloth bear, um, you know, a pair of them, uh, as we were returning back to camp after an, after, uh, after an evening game drive. And uh, besides that, we had uh, all the major land, uh, large mammals, uh, rhino, elephant, uh, multiple elephants, uh, buffalo, um, our, our usual uh, sightings of gibbons and uh, uh, gangetic dolphin eluded us this time because of uh, issues with the weather at Kaziranga. But uh, we did see the cat langur, which is a species we don't get to see every time. Um, and uh, from this trip, I have... Uh, chosen a few photos that I have taken and uh, a couple of my guests have been generous enough to share uh, some of their pictures uh, for me to uh, post process on today's uh, webinar. And uh, I hope you will all enjoy the post processing sessions as uh, you mostly tend to do. But uh, before I start the post processing uh, workshop, I would like to share a little story with you from my last trip, and it is uh, quite an exciting story. So, 
uh, while we were at Kanha, uh, we stayed there at the Singinawa Jungle Lodge, which is a fabulous property that we always use. And uh, the layout of the property is such that you have a central sort of dining bar and library area where everybody meets. And then you have cottages strewn around uh, the over 110 acres that the property sprawls across. And uh, this time my room, uh, my cottage was at the far end of the, uh, of the property, um, practically adjoining the national park. And uh, like most of the properties we stay at, Singinawa does not have uh, any fence uh, hindering the movement of animals across the landscape. Um, now, since I was at the far end of the property uh, for meals, for meeting guests in the morning, um, and, and you know, every time I had to go to the, uh, the central dining area of the property, I would have to walk about um, maybe about half a kilometer or a little less to get there. And uh, in the daytime, that was fine, of course. But at night, uh, I would often have uh, uh, deer and wild pigs around. And uh, of course, Singinawa is a property where uh, tigers and leopards routinely traverse through the property. Not that we always get to see them in the property, but uh, there, there's plenty of evidence to suggest their presence. And uh, especially at night, um, uh, when I go out from my room to the dining area, I'm always very careful about what is around. I'm not as worried about the big cats as I am about the wild boar, because those guys can be really temperamental. And I always shine my flashlight around to make sure that uh, the coast is clear as I walk. And uh, frequently uh, there are spotted deer, which is the most common form of uh, ungulate prey in that area. And, uh, you know, as spotted deer graze and move around, you can hear them uh, walking through the uh, vegetation. And that is always a comforting uh, sound uh, while walking in the dark, because you know that when the deer are around and they are calm, things are usually fine. If uh, there is a big cat around, the deer will become alert. They'll start giving alarm calls and they'll warn. Um, so anyhow, um, one morning, you know, uh, as an expedition leader, your days begin really, really early. Uh, when you are on these trips, you go out on uh, early morning game drives. You start before sunrise and uh, therefore your days are uh, always uh, with an early start. And uh, this morning, uh, this was the 15th of March. Um, it was our last morning at Kanha on that trip. And uh, I usually set my alarm for about quarter past four in the morning. Um, and uh, that morning, I remember waking up to spotted deer giving alarm calls uh, practically outside my window. It was, uh, I remember one spotted deer and uh, I, I woke up to that sound. I checked my watch, uh, it was four o'clock and uh, you know, I was so tired and uh, so sleepy that I thought, uh, well, it's 15 minutes before my alarm is supposed to go off. So I might as well go back to sleep. I. I in the in the back of my mind, I could hear the spotted deer, and I, you know, my mind was processing that, and I was wondering what it could be, whether it was a leopard around, or uh, something else. But uh, presuming it to be a leopard on the move, and uh, it being very dark and very cold outside, I just chose not to get out of bed and went right back to sleep. Anyhow, my alarm rang when it was supposed to, and I woke up, made myself some coffee, got ready, and, uh, you know, got my gear together and uh, started walking outside my room and uh, walking towards the dining area. And, uh, you know, one uh, very, uh, uh, you know, curious thing I noticed was 
the silence that morning. It wasn't an eerie silence. I wouldn't call it eerie. Uh, uh, it was uh, it was curious. Um, I couldn't hear the usual comforting sounds of spotted deer grazing and moving around. There was absolute silence, and uh, I did shine my flashlight around, uh, looking for eye shine and looking for things like that. And uh, you know, finding nothing, and uh, you know, it was almost becoming time for uh, us to meet and uh, go on a game drive. I walked to the uh, dining area. I met my guests. We all got in the Jeeps and we went off on our last game drive at Kana. And then later that morning, we came back to camp. We packed our bags and we left for uh, the airport because that was the day we were leaving for Calcutta where we would spend the night and the next morning we were supposed to go to Kaziranga. So, um, you know, the morning's incidents uh, were forgotten through the uh, course of the game drive and the following uh, hurry to get packed and get going. And I had completely forgotten all about it. And then uh, we were about half an hour from the airport when the camp manager, my friend Dipankar, sends me this text. I actually attached a screenshot in the slides. So after we had left, when the housekeeping staff came to clean up the rooms and get the camp ready, uh, this is what they found right outside my room, the tracks of an adult tigress. So <laughs> uh, at 4am that morning, this tigress had come, come calling um, and had practically walked past my room as I uh, snoozed my alarm button and went back to sleep. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed that story and I shall, without further ado, get into working on the pictures that I've chosen to work on from that trip. So let's start with, I'll start with my pictures and then I'll uh, work on the pictures of a couple of my guests uh, who were so generous to share their pictures with me. Um, so I have two tiger pictures that I've chosen from the trip. Both of them are of the same animal from Bandavga Tiger Reserve. And I'm wondering which one to work on. Um, this is an easy picture. Uh, let's start with this one. Uh, the reason I've chosen this is because uh, it's a nice, clear uh, picture of a tiger with uh, you know no obstructions, nice view of it. Of course, I hate the fact that the perspective of the picture is top down. I was uh, in the Jeep and we were at a uh, height on the road and we were shooting down at the tiger, which uh, as most of you who have uh, attended my past uh, post-processing workshops will know that uh, that is something that I do not like. I prefer uh, getting to the animal's eye level or lower, but sometimes, sometimes it is just what it is and you've got to make the best of that situation. So let's start working on this picture. Um, I'll start with cropping. Uh, plenty of space to the left of the tiger. Uh, Now you notice that as I crop, I'm losing a bit of the tiger shadow here on the ground, which might be a good thing to retain in the picture. But then that is messing up my rule of the thirds composition a bit. So I'll just Place the tiger's elbow right here at this in intersection of the rule of the thirds. And see the hump of the tiger's back is right here. And uh, this should look fine. Uh, 
as you can see, this picture has been exposed to the right. If you look at the histogram here, which is something I always advocate and talk about a lot. Let's start by reducing the exposure a bit because some details appear to have been lost uh, in the whites of the picture, but let's see how much we can recover. I'll bring down the exposure by a third of a stop, that is minus 0 0.30, and I'll pull down my highlights a little bit, or minus 70 should be fine. I'll pull up the shadows a bit. So as you can notice, what I'm actually doing is making the picture flatter and getting as much detail out of the whites and blacks as possible. And now I'm going to work on the levels or and, and try and get some contrast out of the picture. Now, there is something wrong in this picture with the lighting. And uh, for those of you who have already noticed it, uh, congratulations. For those of you who haven't, it is that while there is plenty of light on the uh, background and on the body of the tiger, the face of the tiger happens to be in the shadow. So that definitely will affect the quality of the picture a bit. Uh, let's see if uh, improving contrast a bit helps. There will be tone curves a bit. That does improve as I as I pull up the mid tones on the curves. That does improve the amount of uh, light there is on the tiger's face, which is where we want it. That should be about right. Now to get into white balance, we'll hang on here. I see that as I pull the tone curve up, the some of the whites uh, are getting lost here. Look how this uh, triangle on the right hand side of the histogram is uh, getting highlighted in yellow. So to control that, we will pull down the whites in the exposure sliders a bit. And that should be fine now. Back to white balance. As usual, I'll always try with auto and then see how I want the temperature and the tint tailored to my personal taste. So when I hit auto, uh, Lightroom decides that it will reduce the temperature from 4850 to 4550. And it does not touch the tint at all, which suggests that the tint is fine uh, in this picture. I like my pictures slightly on the warmer side, uh, especially when they come from uh, Central India or any of those landscapes where uh, golden and yellow play a big role in the in the look of the landscape. Therefore, I will uh, keep the temperature at 4800. Uh, and not go down all the way to 4550. Um, I'll pull up the vibrance a bit to add some uh, saturation in the muted parts of the picture. And uh, 
maybe add a little bit of saturation. As you can see, these areas of the picture here in this top left corner around the legs of the tiger, the hind, feet, hind quarter of the tiger, they're getting a little, uh, appearing to be a little burnt out or blown out. We'll take care of that later. And you can see again the, uh, the triangle on the right hand side of the histogram is glowing red. Uh, but again, we'll look at that later. We'll keep that in mind and keep that for later. So I'll add some vignetting to the picture because the corners are quite bright and I don't need them to be that bright. I want attention on my tiger, not on the corners of the picture. And as you can see, after adding about 20 points of vignetting, um, the corner brightness or uh, overexposure has been addressed. And uh, this triangle in the uh, histogram is also fine. Add some sharpness. Reduce the radius to the minimum possible. Uh, this picture was taken um, with the Nikon D500 and my 200 to 500 millimeter lens at ISO 2000, uh, focal length of 200, and uh, um, you know, uh, aperture wide open at f5.6. So ISO 2000 will add some amount of grain, not a lot of grain, but uh, definitely enough grain for me to want to add a little bit of masking as I sharpen the picture. I'll, uh, I don't think I would want to add any noise reduction to this picture because it does not appear to be unnecessarily noisy. And I will now click um, remove chromatic aberration and enable lens corrections. As you enable lens corrections, uh, when Lightroom corrects um, issues with the lenses, it will correct, it will first fix distortion and then the vignetting from the lens that uh, it has in its database. And when that happens, it is going to reduce the vignetting you added to the picture a little bit. So you might want to, might or might not want to add some more vignetting depending upon what your frame is like. And, uh, and uh, with that, I think uh, this picture is done. Uh, let's have a look at what the original looked like and what it looks like now. So that's what the original looked like. And uh, this is what it looks like now. There is another picture of the same tiger that I will quickly edit. And here he was rolling on his back like a big house cat, which is really what they really are. Um, in this picture, uh, you see, uh, this was one of the very few pictures from this series that I actually managed to get a clear view of the tiger's eye. Uh, in most of the other pictures, his face was covered behind these little tufts of grass that you see here. So, you know, that's just another reminder of how important it is to try and shoot as many frames per second as you can while photographing wildlife, because you never know, you might have that one frame or two frames in a hundred shots where the animal's eye is visible or the animal's face is just right and the remaining 98 might be just useless because uh, you know either the face is covered or the eye is behind a strand of grass. And uh, you know if you if you if you don't uh, set your camera uh, while shooting wildlife, you shoot as many frames as it can, uh, whatever its capacity might be per second, uh, then you are definitely uh, going to be losing out a lot of very nice shots.
again while cropping i'll keep in mind the rule of the thirds and uh, what i'm trying to do here is to get the tigers back to rest on this line of the lower rule of the thirds line uh, but i can't do that without uh, without altering the photos aspect ratio by choosing a 5 is to 7 aspect ratio also i am not being able to gain much so i will go right back to the standard aspect ratio of 3 is to 2 and uh, see how best it can be managed uh, it is very important to leave enough room uh, outside the head of the animal you know between the head of the animal and the frame to not make it look something like that you know that looks very odd and very weird and it is always important to leave some space some some breathing space some viewing space in the direction in which the animal is looking and also uh, you know especially above its head uh, in, in a picture like this Again, this is a nicely exposed to the right picture, but of course the animal is in shadow and there is a lot of uh, blown highlight over here, which I'll try to first control by reducing the highlights to the maximum. And uh, now I'll pull up the shadows to some extent to try and get some uh, details out of the animal's face. before proceeding to work with the levels. Again, very important not to overdo anything. Overdoing these edits makes pictures just look artificial and unreal. My editing philosophy, my uh, post-processing philosophy is always to uh, try and produce as close as possible a genuine um, replica of um, the situation in which I took that picture. If uh, if the light was warm, um, you know uh, what the colors were like. It's it's very important to me personally that my wildlife pictures look natural, that they reflect what I saw for real, and they also reflect what I felt for real. So in, in trying to communicate to your viewer what you felt, uh, I think you have plenty of artistic uh, leeway to try and uh, uh, work with your picture in a way to convey that. But to, uh, you know, to, to, to alter a picture or to manipulate a picture too much, beyond that in my opinion in my style of photography uh is is no longer photography it then becomes digital art which is in itself a great thing i uh, absolutely have no judgment of that but uh, as a wildlife photographer as a natural history photographer i try and convey in my pictures what i saw in nature in the most aesthetic and beautiful way rather than trying to create unreal um, undoubtedly good looking but unreal pieces of art which is why i'm always very careful about uh, not adding too many layers not changing the color of the sky uh, you know not removing or adding elements to the picture and uh, things like that those things are in my personal post processing philosophy complete no no Again, I'll just reduce the temperature slightly. Uh, the tint looks absolutely perfect. And I'll add some uh, vibrance to uh, add some saturation to the unsaturated, to the muted parts of the picture. 
uh, without overdoing it, without making it look unreal, and some overall saturation as well. Again, not a lot, uh, maybe about seven points for this picture. Again, add some vignetting to draw in focus onto our tiger. And now sharpness. And uh, we should nearly be done. And uh, this is how the picture looked originally. And this is how it looks now. Definitely it looks much better. The colors, everything looks much nicer, but it looks 100% natural and not manipulated. Now I shall start working on uh, some pictures shared my, by my guests with me. Um, Jay Hull, who is probably watching this webinar right now, shared these pictures of uh, a tigress and her two cubs that uh, he saw uh, while on a game drive at Kana. And he shared uh, these four pictures uh, of them. Um, of these, I prefer, you know, I like this one quite a lot, uh, the cub nuzzling the mother. But I prefer this one here because um, in, in this picture, Jay, if you are listening, uh, and since you asked for constructive criticism, in this picture, the tail of the tiger has been, uh, tail of uh, one of the cubs has been uh, slipped off. It's, it's outside the frame. And uh, in this picture, you not only have the tails of both mother and cub in the frame, but you also have a nice view of the mother's face, which I quite like. This is a tigress called MB3, and uh, a tigress that I'm personally quite fond of. And it was great to see her with her cubs uh, multiple times um, on, on this Grand Indias wildlife adventure. We saw MB3 only on that last game drive, but we saw her cubs um, on at least two other game drives. So as I uh, frame this picture for a crop, I'm going to uh, place MB3's face in this uh, rule of thirds corner here. And I'm going to retain this uh, log of wood that is lying, this dead branch that is lying here uh, in a way to, uh, in, a, in a way that it frames the picture from the bottom. And there we have our crop. This picture is also, uh, it's, well, it's not exactly exposed to the right or the left. Uh, it's exposed uh, mostly in the center, which is not a bad place to start with. Um, the, uh, there are some blue uh, uh, tones in the left-hand side, that is the darker side of the frame. Um, Jay was shooting with a Canon EOS R5 mirrorless body, and uh, the 100 to 400, 4.5 to 5.6 L lens that has been so popular for so many years with Canon. And this picture was shot again at ISO 2000 uh, at 400 millimeters of length and f5.6. You might notice the shutter speed. Uh, he was shooting at 1, 1,250th of a second. And uh, that is, uh, a nice reminder of how important it is to have a high shutter speed, ideally uh, one one thousandth of a second or higher, to try and freeze motion while shooting wildlife. Let's see if we can add some exposure, uh, open up the picture a bit, add some light. Uh, I'll add half a stop of exposure. Uh, there and then I'll again pull down the highlights to see how much details that exposes. Um, and uh, as I tend to do, as I was explaining earlier, 
I'll uh, not only pull down the highlights a bit, uh, but also pull up the shadows a bit to try and get some more detail out. Although, of course, that does make the picture appear flatter or more muted. But that is something I'm going to address later now with the levels. I'll pull out my whites to the extent I can without losing detail. And then pull down my blacks to the extent I can without losing detail. So you see it, you know, the, the look at the eye detail on the tigress come out as I play around with the whites and blacks. See how much more clearer and prominent her face is. Of course, the cub has his eyes partly shut, so that's why I'm looking at the tigress's eye to uh, do my adjustments. Add some more contrast, uh, not a lot, just maybe five points. Now, this picture does look very warm. Uh, the tint look uh, tint does look uh, like it is a lot to the uh, to the cayenne side. So we'll see what Lightroom thinks of that. Uh, now that is what Lightroom has tried to do to try and bring the colors down to a more natural look. Um, again, it was originally shot at uh, a temperature of 4850 and Lightroom brought it down to 4000 and uh, it brought down the tint from 13 to 8. I will bring the tint down uh, like Lightroom suggested, but I'll still try and see if I can keep a slightly warmer uh, temperature and see what that does to the picture. Uh, it still does look a little bit too warm. So I'll uh, bring it further down. Uh, when, you're, when you're in doubt about temperature and uh, white balance, one great way to fix that is to use this eyedropper tool. But uh, the eyedropper tool requires you to find a spot on the picture that is either white or gray to be able to, uh, you know, make an accurate uh, measurement of the correct white balance. But it is not always possible to find uh, an ideal white or an ideal gray on uh, wildlife pictures. So it is important to actually play around with the numbers and see, uh, ultimately let your eye uh, be the final judge. But uh, let's see what the eyedropper tool thinks. Well, it's brought the tint further down to one. And uh, I found a spot of white here, of pure white on the, you know, behind the tigers here. And uh, it doesn't look too bad at all. Um, but I'll still keep it warmer at 4400. The colors definitely look more natural. Now I'll add some some vibrance. Also, adding vibrance lets you lets you judge uh, what colors are off again. So this does look too green to me. So I'll still add some more tint. Saturation. Uh, I forgot to play with the tone curves.
creating I think vignetting, as you noticed, uh, uh, made us lose some of our blacks, but we'll see what lens correction does to that. Um, to get back those blacks, we'll just pull the black slider down a bit, just a tiny bit and it's gone. So yeah, that's what the picture looks like now. This is what it looked like originally. This is what it looks like now. Original. And now. I added some more contrast just because I felt that would be nice. Now let's work on another picture. This has been uh, this has been submitted by Cliff, and uh, Cliff, if you're watching, this was one of your pictures I really really liked. Uh, it's a nice simple portrait of a rhino. And it was that rhino that had the largest horn uh, among all the ones that we saw. And this is in fact quite a large horn for uh, an Indian one horn rhinoceros. Usually their horns are about half that size. Um, Cliff was shooting with an Olympus EM1 Mark III and uh, he was using a lens that all of us looked enviously at. Uh, it uh, was a 150 to 400 f4.5 lens that had a built-in teleconverter, a 1.25x built-in teleconverter, which with just one click of your thumb, you could turn your lens into a 300 to uh, close to something like a 600, uh, right, just with a click of your thumb. So great equipment uh, and a beautiful picture. Let's start working on it. Uh, one thing that I think could have been improved in this picture was that uh, if, if we could have included this leg of the rhino, this foreleg, uh, it would have looked a lot more pleasant. Uh, you know, it's uh, in, in the, the way it's been composed here, uh, part of the leg seems to be missing or chopped off and incompleteness never looks uh, nice. So that's one thing I wish. Uh, Cliff uh, would have kept in mind while shooting, but you know, when you're shooting wildlife, it's often not impossible, uh, uh, often not possible to keep your mind because things are happening so quickly. So what I'll do is, while working on this picture, I'll focus on the rhino's face and the rhino's head, and make it a close portrait of. Uh, a rhino head study. There you go. Um, this picture again hasn't been exactly exposed to the right, uh, but we'll see how much detail we can get out of it. Uh, you can see from uh, the beginning that uh, some details in the black, in the dark areas of the picture have been lost. We'll see what we can do to fix that. I'll increase exposure a little bit. Um, a third of a stop. Um, I'll reduce the highlights a bit. As soon as I reduce the highlights, see how the details in these areas, uh, in the bright areas, especially areas like here, uh, immediately become more apparent. Like right now, uh, if I reset the highlights back to zero, this looks blown out and too bright. But as I pull the highlights down, the details there start to appear. Again, I'll pull up shadows a bit to try and 
uh, get some more details in these dark areas and under the nostrils, in the folds of the neck, uh, etc. And uh, then I'll begin working on my levels. So the point of doing this in this order is that you try and get as much detail out of your picture as you can uh, in the process in a, inadvertently making it flatter and then get as much contrast out of the picture as you can in order to make it pop out. Too much and too much contrast and you, you start losing details again. I don't want to make it too contrasty, uh, yet I want all the details out to the maximum potential. Back to white balance. This is what Lightroom thinks and I do not approve of what Lightroom thinks. Um, the picture looks quite nicely white balanced to begin with. Uh, but let's again try the eyedropper tool and see if uh, artificial intelligence thinks uh, or knows any better than we do. There's, with, with rhinos, you're never short of gray, gray portions. That doesn't look too bad. Add some more vibrance. Makes the greens pop out nicely. And some overall saturation, just a little bit. Now in a picture like this, um, especially with animals like rhinos and elephants, you know, animals that are gray and dark, I will uh, always try uh, before I finish uh, by trying at least once to see how they look in monochrome. Uh, we'll, we'll try that after I'm done processing this in color first. Now again in a picture like this where you have uh, such a close view of an animal's beautiful skin patterns, these cracks and you know um, the, the folds of the rhino skins, I'll try and enhance those by adding a little bit of texture. And our usual vignetting to uh, bring attention to our subject before we go on to sharpness. I found uh, through trial and error that uh, in most cases uh, with wildlife, pictures in most cases a standard sharpening amount really works well um, but that's only true for most cases not all cases in some pictures you might not want to add that much sharpness or any sharpness at all The addition of vignetting has caused some blacks to be lost. 
I'll recover those right here. And there's our Rhino. Um, you know, the way it looks now versus what it looked like originally. And uh, before I finish, I'd like to see how this looks in black and white. I think it will look really nice in black and white. It does. Uh, you know, anytime uh, you're shooting dark animals like uh, rhinos and elephants, you know, animals in monochrome colors to begin with, uh, do try uh, post-processing them in black and white or sepia and see how those tones and colors look. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this picture and keep one in color and the other in black and white. So we'll keep this in black and white and keep the other one in original color. Also for uh, those of you who um, use Lightroom or uh, you know Photoshop, etc., uh, do look at the presets. There are some really nice presets available uh, that can uh, really um, help you with quick editing and quick color correction. Uh, let's let's see. Here we have some black and white presets uh, that Lightroom has, and you know, a lot of them can make this picture look really nice. You can try all sorts of creative things and get some really nice quick edits, quick post-processing with the presets. I don't use them a lot, but sometimes, especially with landscape pictures and especially with monochrome pictures, uh, pictures in black and white or sepia tone, I do like playing around with, this, with these presets uh, quite a bit. Anyhow, I hope you found that uh, post-processing exercise useful and uh, found something to learn. And I'm really looking forward to your questions, but before I um, ask uh, before I start answering your questions, I would like to play a video that uh, Jay Hull sent me from that sighting of the tigers with cubs. This is one of the male cubs from Pana Tiger itself. I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, I look forward to any questions that you might have. Aditya, thank you so much. You, one of the people in the comments said you are the master, and I, I have to agree. <laughs> master yeah. of photo editing, your new moniker. Um, before we start, I just want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, Let's start with a, a trip-oriented question. Um, we have some folks who are really interested in birds. Will guides on these trips be knowledgeable and interested in birds or just the big fauna? Absolutely. Uh, the Grand India Wildlife Adventure, especially, is uh, something that I always tell my guests, not just a tiger trip or a rhino trip or an elephant trip. It is truly and really an Indian wildlife trip, because on this trip you see more variety and more diversity in a two-week period of time than you would on any other trip, um, uh, on any other wildlife trip to India. And uh, our guides, our expedition leaders, are naturalists. Uh, they are, you know, masters of all trades. Um, and of course, it depends upon an individual guest's interests, whether they are interested more in megafauna or uh, birds or everything. But uh, all our expedition leaders and uh, even our local guides in these parks are master birders. And we do see some fabulous uh, birds on these trips. Uh, in fact, uh, between the destinations that we cover on this trip, 
we nearly cover half of all the bird species found in India. So we do uh, have a good amount of birding on these trips. And, uh, you know, if, if you're looking forward to birding on this trip, you will not be left disappointed. Excellent. Um, what, uh, let's see, do you normally shoot 2000 ISO? No, I don't. Um, I have, uh, you know, I usually uh, leave my ISO in uh, auto mode. So I set a minimum limit and a maximum limit. And uh, what I have increasingly begun doing is focusing on my shutter speed. Uh, so in, in most cameras, you can set uh, an auto ISO range uh, from say minimum ISO of 100, which most cameras have, till uh, I, for example, choose an upper limit of 6400. I don't want to be shooting higher than that unless in extremely uh, exceptional circumstances. So uh, I'll set my uh, upper limit for ISO at 6400 and I'll, sh I'll, I'll set my shutter speed to be a minimum of one one thousandth of a second. So what the camera is going to do is that it is uh, going to try and keep the shutter speed above one one thousandth of a second to the extent possible and while choosing the minimum ISO required to be able to achieve that speed in a way uh, what it is doing is it is trying to give me the best shutter speed for the lowest possible ISO under the circumstances I'm shooting in. So it is basically doing what uh, in, in earlier days with uh, less uh, sophisticated gear we used to manually or physically do uh, by setting, dialing in the ISO each time for each shot and uh, choosing the shutter speed and aperture. Hmm. Okay, why not do the lens correction before the color correction? It doesn't really make a difference. Um, I do it in that order simply because the sliders in Lightroom are you know, laid out in that order. So, I mean, if you uh, wanted to do the lens corrections first, that would also work, work absolutely fine. Hmm. Um, what parks do you suggest for a first safari, uh, first tiger and bird safari, and how many days in each park? Well, um, our Grand India Wildlife Adventure is uh, actually the ideal trip for uh, somebody wanting an introduction to Indian wildlife, uh, having a great chance to uh, watch tigers in the wild, yet having a phenomenal variety of other wildlife, birds included. And uh, that is definitely the trip I would suggest to anybody who is coming to India on safari for the first time. And then um, there are people who uh, like to do that trip, um, get a broad idea of Indian wildlife, get to see as much variety as they can, and then come back later for more uh, tiger pictures and tiger uh, specific you know tiger focused uh, trips and for them i usually suggest the india tiger quest uh, trip so for anybody who is visiting india for the first time uh, grand india wildlife adventure is definitely the trip for you it's a 12 day trip uh, you know and you can some people choose to come on a two day uh, extension uh, after the trip to see the taj mahal but the wildlife portion of the trip is 12 days. We spend uh, about three nights each in three different parks, two in Central India and one in Northeastern India. Excellent. Well, I think that's the last question we have time for today. So I will turn it back to you for closing comments. Thank you, Sunny, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's uh, webinar, uh, got to learn uh, a little from my post-processing workshops. And uh, I'll be off on safari again tomorrow. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all, uh, well, not very soon, but <laughs> soon enough, uh, probably towards the end of April. Excellent. Thanks again, Aditya. And I want to thank everybody else who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars.
We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everybody.